Justice is a very complex thing, isn't it? Be a tough job being a judge, I think. How often is something an accident? Is that a, a random event? Or is it actually a consequence of neglectful or bad behaviour? For example, does a drunk driver who kills someone cause an accident? Or is it murder or manslaughter? I've seen people get seriously injured because the guy before didn't do his job properly. Building scaffold in that case. Should disobedience or malicious intent be treated the same if they both result in the same consequence? Why is it that 200 years ago, stealing a loaf of bread would mean that you're sent halfway around the world for years, but if you stole a loaf of bread today, there'd be virtually no consequence? What changed in our society's thinking for that to happen? That's a huge change. What changed in our society when murder used to be a capital offence? You murder, the state will kill you, take your life. Then it meant life in prison. Then life meant maybe 20 years in prison. Now it might mean 10 years in prison and time on parole. Is changing the philosophy from punishment to correction a good thing or not? Why do we want justice for everyone else but we want everyone to believe our excuses when it comes to us? Why don't we care about things that offend God, particularly as Christians? How do we balance The crime, as they say, with the time. The offence with the punishment. Especially now when the very idea of punishment is offensive. By whose politics, nationality, race, religion, whatever, do we make justice just? Is it possible? Justice is complicated, isn't it? Well, I hope you're feeling blessed today. We have many things to be thankful for, don't we? And therefore, we should be counting the blessings in our lives. But you might remember, go back all the way to Revelation chapter 1, and we saw that, that we are blessed if we read the words of this prophecy And we are blessed if we hear it and take to heart what is written. I think that's verse 3 or something. So it'd be good to reflect now, coming so far through Revelation, on how you've been blessed as we've been going through this book, as we've been reading it, hopefully been taking it to heart. People are, well, we're doing it here. Growth groups are following through. Uh, And I hope you've been doing it at home. What have you learned? How have you been blessed in some way? How has the study of Revelation changed you? See, as a whole, the Bible is God's revelation of himself, of his character, of his working throughout history, in the life, death, resurrection of Jesus, his son, And as Matty said, we see this call to respond to that in repentance and then we receive his forgiveness and a fresh start. We see those things clearly in Scripture. The book of Revelation is a particular revelation of God's dealings in the last days. The last days are the time from God's incarnation when he came as a baby about to celebrate at Christmas and the time when he comes again, his second coming. 
We are blessed if we appreciate the fullness of God's character in his patience, in his grace, in his love, in his mercy, in his warnings. And we also get this fuller picture, particularly in Revelation, but in many other places, of his justice, his judgment, and his wrath. All those things and more make up God's character. But it's these last three characteristics, his justness, his judgment, and his wrath, I want to focus on today that we may find troubling, unpleasant. But we are not at liberty to make God in the image that we would like him to be. We might make him like Santa, but he's not. And we also understand that we are not at liberty. We've got to heed that warning in the, la- in the third last verse of the last chapter, of the last book of Revelation, which says that we are not to take away or add to the words of this prophecy, despite what we think about those words or how we see them describing God in the fullness of his character. I imagine most of us would think, like to think that justice, judgment and punishment need to be based on a few things, on an objective standard. That... that uh, that standard is the reference point there that decisions are made without fear or favour or prejudice. It doesn't matter who they are or their income or whatever. The law is that objective standard that should apply to everyone. I would think that we agree with that. I would think that also that law has to be treated, applied consistently to people, all people and throughout time. But if we struggle with these things ourselves, in terms of how we, as it were, think about our own behaviour, have we done something wrong or not, we, we have to uh, have, a, have a sense of justice, of truth and right and wrong when we evaluate ourselves, and that's a struggle, let alone trying to apply that to our families and our children and the relationships in the home. Then we've got the societal perspective, which amps it up more, as we've seen, with even greater complexity. And then think of that now over different nations and cultures. And now think of that throughout time. Justice is complicated, but this passage today reminds us several times that we might struggle with it, but God's justice is just. God's justice is just. So let's have a look at that. We're going to quickly move through this passage and then reflect on God's justice again at the end. In chapters two and uh, twelve and thirteen, last week we saw dragons and beasts and terror and chaos as they exercised their authority over the earth, forcing people to receive this mark of the beast and to worship him. Otherwise, they face death. In chapter fourteen today, we have a thankful reprieve from that image, and we see the lamb. Jesus with his people who have remained faithful to him. We go back as we saw back, I think it was chapter 7, the 144,000 represent believers who have endured persecution on earth and are now ready to join with their saviour and enjoy those eternal benefits and blessings of life with him forever. They have this awesome privilege of learning a new song 
that only they can learn and praise God with. That's an interesting idea, isn't it? Why only them? As Debbie said, that's what it's all about, praising him. These guys get their own special song. We have there in verse 4 that they have not defiled themselves with women for they remain virgins. That is, they've kept themselves pure as virgins and they've followed the lamb wherever he goes. And we see that there was no lie, uh, no lie was found in their mouths and they were blameless, verse 5. Just remember the, the complex and symbolic language of Revelation here. We need to understood this as symbolically referring to their purity and their devotion. I'm sure a few of that 140,000 were married and they were men and women, so we've just got to appreciate the intent here that they were pure, that they were devoted to the Lord. They're following him, whatever he does. We also saw that purity back in chapter 7 where we see that these ones had been washed clean that their robes were made white by the red blood of Christ. And here we see these people of God uh, in their glorified state. These servants have suffered persecution. They've possibly, in fact, most likely been killed for their faith. And now they are brought into God's presence in heaven. John now sees another series of three angels. The first angel, verse 6, had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. Jesus says this same thing, actually, in verse uh, Matthew 24, where he says, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached to the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. You see, revelation, building, uh, fulfilling what Jesus had said there. Countless people and communities over time have heard the gospel as it has been shared to them, as Maddie encourages to do, on the street in the field, in homes, in churches, by those people that know its truth and power and forgiveness and grace. How could we ever keep it in, as that great song goes? The gospel has transformed individuals and communities for 2,000 years, bringing spiritual transformation, bringing social renewal, but also coming with that education, health care, and so much, much more. The Bible, or parts of it, have been translated into 3,658 different languages. The Bible that contains that gospel message, so important to translate so people have it in their heart language so they can read it for themselves. And that's why we as a church support the work of Albert and Lynn as they translate the Bible into the Ban Wan language in the Philippines. With so much at stake with the gospel, it's important that we are all crystal clear on what the gospel is and whether we have responded to it appropriately. I'm just going to pretty much repeat what Maddie shared before. And, you know, as I was actually talking with Dawn, so often those on the music team know how the last, God, without collusion, God lines up the songs to fit the sermon, particularly the last, and he's done it again today musically. But I was sitting there listening to Maddie go through the gospel and I thought, now I'm going to repeat just what she said. So God must have a reason for that. So listen carefully. The gospel is, okay, as Maddie so clearly showed today and over the previous uh, six weeks, seven weeks, that God created all things good. In fact, Revelation 1 says that he created us very good when he got to people. But we have all sinned against God's righteous rule. 
We're all doing it our own way. We do it the Frank Sinatra, the old Blue Eyes principle here. <laughs> and because of that, we've offended a righteous, holy, pure God. We've ignored him. But the other consequence, we, in the sense of the vertical relationship, we've damaged with God, but sin is invariably going to damage what we say are horizontal relationships with each other. The two invariably go together. God is just in his judgment, as we're going to see today. And so ultimately, in accordance actually with our choice of ignoring or rejecting him, that is the basis by which he will judge us. We'll be separated from him in death in a place called hell. Not a wonderful place, actually. Only good things come from God, and to have them removed is not nice. To have his, his gracious influence on the preserving and sustaining influence that he has on this earth, to have that removed is a serious thing, dreadful thing. And so that's our condition. But God loves us. He created us. He doesn't want to leave us there. So he said, I've got to do something about these crazy sinful people that don't want me. I'm going to continue to reach out to them. I know they don't deserve it, but I will reach out. Despite all our willful rebellion, our ignoring of him, God graciously reaches out to us. And he offers to forgive our sin. He offers to take it upon himself on the cross. That's what's happening on the cross. I said to a couple of people recently, you know, if Jesus had authority and power to drive out demons, to raise the dead, to heal the sick, to do this, and to call upon 10,000 angels, why is he hanging up there? It's a question. We have to think about why, because of his great love. Why, because he's taking our place. Why, because he's bearing the sin that we have that's been placed upon him. That's why. He is our substitute, atoning for our sin. This amazing grace is the greatest transaction there is. Not only does he take our sin, but he gives, gives us his righteousness, his right standing before God. That is the great news of the gospel. Amen? But it doesn't just happen. It's not universal. All people don't get it because a lot of people, as we've seen throughout Revelation, don't want it. The gift has to be received, unpacked, responded to, opened up. And we do that to so recognise our rebellion and humbly come to him in repentance to turn away from the direction of our sin, turn around and now follow Jesus. And as we receive his forgiveness and we let him reign over our lives, we can then live out the challenge and the adventure of walking each day with him. Verse 7 shows us what this looks like there. A few points. To fear God. Fear God is to have this awesome respect for him. We can't treat him lightly. We can't treat him casually. It's not a, oh, yeah, whatever. It's a, whoa. You remember being called up to the principal as a kid at school? That. You know he's a good guy, but he's got a job to do. Whatever you did, he's got to fix or respond to. That sense of, whoa. This is serious, We're getting called up. That is what, a bit of what the fear of the God is, awesome respect. 
We see there also that we're to give him glory by living lives that honour him. And we see there also that we're to worship him, to give worth to. But we sing as part of worship. Worship is a whole of life response to who God is. Uh, For a little while on Sunday morning, we sing as part of worship. It's a lot more than singing. We're acknowledging he's worthy because of who he is and what he has done. That is what it looks like, a response like that. So we see now over these uh, chapters that things are now coming to a close. And we see that this first angel has been proclaiming the gospel of life. The second angel there in verse 8 declares that Babylon has fallen and chapters 17 through to 19 is going to to unpack that, expound that further. So it's like take that verse 8 and boom, take it over to those next chapters. Now the third angel gives a solemn warning of torment, of no rest for those who rejected the offer of the gospel and chose instead to worship the beast and receive his mark. In contrast, we have in verse 13, the dead who are in the Lord, they they will rest from their labour. And that's about to happen in verses 14 to 20, where we see there are two harvests. The first harvest, when we... um, we see there the Son of Man is there. He's got a golden crown. The Son of Man was the title from the book of Daniel that Jesus used when describing himself, talking about it's, it's, it's a reference to being Messiah. The crown of gold is a symbol of his authority. And so we see that Jesus will take that sickle and harvest his people from the earth. There are allusions, allusions, not allusions to this in the Gospels. When Jesus shared about the parable of the wheat and the weeds, he's going to separate those two. About the vine and the branches, branches that don't bear fruit will be cut off and thrown into the fire and and many other places. This first harvest describes what has become known as the rapture, where God calls his people out of the earth into heaven at some point before, during, or after the tribulation, depending on where you stand on that. But we see this in more detail in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and left will be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, Encourage one another with these words. I hope that encourages you. Now, commentators suggest that between the end of verse 16 and the beginning of verse 17, the events of chapters 15 to 19 occur. Once again, there's a few ideas out there, but um, this idea of a seven-year tribulation, people think, that if this is at the third and a half year, chapters 15 to 19 are going to occur in the final three and a half years. So just keep that in mind as we think about it because at the end of that is this second harvest or more accurately it's a vintage, a grape vintage where you harvest the grapes uh, taking place in verses 19 to 20. Now, there's some very graphic 
symbolic language here, isn't there, about the grapes being ripe, they're ready, cut them off, throw them into the great vat, this great wine press of God's wrath where they're going to be trampled and crushed. And we see there's this huge amount of blood coming forth. And in chapters 6 and 7, we saw the seven seals of God's judgment. In chapters 8 to 11, we saw the seven trumpets. Now let's move forward to chapter 16 and we'll see the final seven bowls of God's wrath. Skip over 15 for now. They follow similar themes. You have to just sort of scan through that as, as I share. Similar themes to the seals and to the trumpets with these ideas of physical affliction in verse 2. We see again that the oceans are going to be affected. We see in verse 3 that the fresh water, rivers and things, streams, is going to be affected as we have before. We see there's going to be signs from heaven in verses 8 and 9 there, just like we did in the others. The river Euphrates there is mentioned again in verse 12. It's going to dry up. That's interesting. As I did my sort of, I don't know, peripheral research, chased a few rabbits down holes this week, I, I became aware that Turkey has built 22 dams on the Tigris and Euphrates River and that depending on what article you read, between 80% to a third of the water flow uh, has been restricted and Syria and Iraq are really angry about that. Don't hear about that on the news, do you? But interesting, fun fact there. So come drought, and if you've got such a, uh, a huge loss of flow already, your possibility. Some would say that uh, you know, all those things we saw are different perspectives on the same event. Others would say they are different events that are growing in, in intensity. But we see there now if the uh, Euphrates dried up, that's going to mean that the kings of the east uh, can move forward. And there's probably been almost as much speculation about who the kings of the east are as there has been on who the beast is, 666, over the years. One scholar has counted 50 different opinions about who those kings or nations might be. Verses 13 and 14 we see this, the dragon, the beast and the false prophets spewing their powerful lies of deception and manipulation to gather the rulers of the world for this great final battle against the Lord at a place called Armageddon in verse 16. This is often associated with Medigo, uh, a town in northern Israel where over the millennia, Many, many, many battles have been fought. Get that. Right, Israel, right in that junction between three continents, Europe, Asia and Africa. And so many battles have been fought there. And just as this great battle between the world and God, now whether that is a physical thing or whether it's a more a, a, a reference to the spiritual state of affairs, as that's about to begin, there is this insertion of Jesus speaking in verse 15. He hasn't spoken since, verse, uh, since chapter 4. What does Jesus say? Look, I come like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and remains clothed so as not to go naked and be shamefully exposed. The warning is clear. Be prepared. We'll all become Boy Scouts. It may be to people that have come to the Lord after the rapture in this three and a half years. It could be that. But it's very much a warning to us as well, is it not? Don't get caught napping. Be prepared. 
the return of the king. It could come at any time. None of us knows. It's certainly closer today than when it was yesterday. Matthew 25 builds on this too, doesn't he? When he talks about the parable of the ten virgins waiting for the bridegroom. Five of them were ready. They're waiting throughout the night. They brought extra oil. They topped up their lamps. The groom finally came, but the other five didn't prepare. They were caught unprepared. They ran out of oil, so they run into town to try and get oil in the middle of the night. I don't know how they plan to do that, but... Then the bridegroom comes, they're not there, and we read pretty scary words. They were locked out. They missed out because they weren't prepared. Be prepared. How do we prepare? What does that mean? We prepare by responding to the gospel, which we've heard twice really clearly this morning. That means we now serving the Lord. We use our skills, our time, talent, money to contribute to the sustaining of this place, to serve. So many aspects of service here go together so that the gospel can be presented here. But it's not just here. It's out there. It's your neighbours. It's sharing this Life-giving gospel is also how we show that we're prepared. We want to share what we've received, knowing what's at stake. Love God and serve him faithfully is how we keep prepared. Then in verse 17 to 21, we see that these Kings, this great army of people that have crossed the Euphrates, that are at Armageddon or however that is going to happen, are resoundedly defeated by God. Through his might, through earthquakes, we see their cities are going to be split, nations are going to collapse, islands are going to flee. Not sure how that's going to work, but that's going... Once again, it's symbolic language. Mountains are going to be lost. So catastrophic are these events going to be. And then we have this giant hail coming from the sky. It's done, we see there. The voice from heaven says. Meanwhile, in heaven, in chapter 15... When I flick back there, there's this great choir singing. Those that have been victorious over the beast. And that victory meant that they did not submit to the beast, though invariably it was going to lead to their death. It's important to see their powerful example and learn from it. Now just think, you know, this mark of the beast, you can't buy or sell. You know, I don't know how big your backyard is, how many veggies you can grow, but that's going to make life really, really hard, isn't it? Like, really? <laughs> Are they going to turn your power and water off because you're not going to pay the bills? Are you going to... You know, there's a couple of things we can learn from Revelation, isn't there? You know... As we saw in the first week, and, and Don and I were talking before, that old janitor, remember what he said? He wins. Jesus wins. But before he wins, it's going to get tough. I had this conversation at home the other day. How are you preparing for those tough days spiritually? Look before, don't become a prepper. You don't have to buy a thousand tins of asparagus. But how are you preparing spiritually the tough days? Now, if we sort of forget about God most days of the week, we don't have time for him. I don't know he's worried. If, oh, yeah, whatever, tomorrow, manana, kick it down the road. If that's, <laughs> that's not going to toughen you up, 
discipline toughs, toughens our up, tough, toughens us up, doesn't it? We live under God's grace, but disciplines such as reading the Bible, such as prayer, are the means of grace, as, 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 the, as they say. They strengthen the grace within us. How are we preparing for that tough time? Because these people, whoever they are, somehow recognised. They clearly teach us that faithfulness to God is even more important than our very lives. They chose death rather than the beast. They chose death and remained faithful to the Lord. Those who do not come to the Lord, we see face torment and that separation. Death for those in Christ is simply being ushered into the glory of the Lord and joining in this amazing choir. Look at that. Great and marvellous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. They're praising God's marvellous deeds, but what else are they saying there? Just and true are your ways, King of the nations. Look at what the angel is saying in 16 verse 5. You are just in these judgments, O Holy One. You who, were, you who are and who were. Verse 7, I heard the altar respond, Yes, Lord God Almighty, true and just are your judgments. God's judgments are true and just. That means they are fair. They are proportionate. The offence is matched appropriately with the judgment, the punishment. And yet you still might there be thinking, it still seems pretty tough to me. I get that. That's a whole other conversation about why we think that, which I had to edit out. But, uh, but look at verse 6. What are they doing? He said, they have shed the blood of your holy people and your prophets. So you have given them blood to drink as they deserve. Verse 9, they curse the name of God. They refuse to repent and glorify him. Verse 11, they curse the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, but they refuse to repent of what they had done. Verse 21, they cursed God. They have seen God's judgments, which were actually warnings. I'd say those judgments we've been looking at over these chapters were gracious in the sense that they're a wake-up call. He didn't just boom. So they've seen those judgments, they've been warned, and they have most likely here seen God take his people up from the earth into heaven. If that was not a clear sign, nothing is. And despite that, Knowledge they have, what they've seen, their absolute defiance remains. The Creator, the Lord, the Holy God of all cannot ignore their murder, their cursing and their refusal. His character, we might, but his character cannot sweep things under the carpet and deny truth, deny the law, deny his righteousness, deny his justice, deny his very character. And in so doing, if he did that, if he did that, he would also be making a mockery of those who have suffered and endured and persevered. He'll be making a mockery of cheap grace and mercy and even worse, as it were, he'd be treating with contempt the sacrifice of Christ's substitutionary death on the cross, making that meaningless. Do you see why he's got to judge justly? Just imagine a judge who let the guilty go free. 
they would be making a mockery of the, the victim's pain. They would be making a mockery of the law. They would be making a mockery of the law-abiding citizens and making a mockery of themselves. Do you see? God is just in his judgment. Yet despite God's patience and warnings, we have humanity's stubborn refusal, defiance, to acknowledge God as the Lord over all that he is. They've refused his offer of grace and forgiveness. That cannot be rewarded by the injustice of not being dealt with. In God's infinite wisdom, his just justice will come as indeed we've seen it throughout the Bible in many places already. So whatever our 21st century Western liberal, subjective, tolerant, transient attitudes might be to justice, change like the wind, as I've shown, we are blessed when we can trust God's justice to be just, to be fair. And it's pretty important because aren't we trusting what the Bible says when it says that God loves us? We trust that. We trust him for salvation. We trust him for his sovereignty in our situations of life when we're struggling. We need to trust also that he is just as his word says about his judgment, along with all those other things that we cling to. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, that you are fair. Lord, as weak, sinful humans who read your word, we struggle. Help us, Lord, to rejoice in the fullness of who you are and recognise that you are full. <laughs> You're a God of love and mercy, justice and wrath. You're all those things and nothing less. Help us to be blessed by grasping that fullness. In your name, amen.